Here I have for um, Senator Natalie Rodriguez Campbell. She'll be absent. Okay. And Chairman um, Senator Scott Mosley will be late. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Sophia. It's been a long time. Too long, too long. <laughs> I shall see you next week. <laughs> Good. So I don't get high? Oh, <laughs> I don't need a personal hand. What is going on? Chairman? <laughs> I'm protecting you. I'm protecting you. Do I? Because I said it together. You know. <laughs> I'm protecting you. Now, um, just to uh, my, my remarks, my remarks will be brief. Um, I wish to thank each member of the committee, our support team so the house, from the Houses of Parliament and elsewhere, uh, PBCJ that has carried us live and everyone who took the time to make contributions towards the development of anti-sexual harassment legislation in Jamaica. We know that members of the public are eager for the finalization and implementation of anti-sexual harassment legislation in Jamaica. I speak for all members of the committee when I say that we're eager to deliver a very good anti-sexual harassment law to our population as well. We know that this bill, when it becomes law, will deal a blow to sexual harassment by bringing relief to victims, punishment to perpetrators, and will hopefully act as a deterrent to others. Jamaica has been waiting on this bill for a very long time. And we have come a far way in the process to make this law. We are now coming to the end of the committee stage, which basically is the middle of the lawmaking process. So we will still, we still have a lot of work left to do. And I'm happy that we are moving at a very, very good pace as we have made a commitment to table the report at least in this quarter of the fiscal year, the first quarter. We appreciate and applaud the interest being shown in the work of this committee by members of the public and members of civil society and know that our deliberations are again being broadcast live on PBCJ on cable and online. And I am very happy that we do have a, a wide audience um, who can uh, monitor our deliberations. So today we continue our clause by clause review of the bill and the proposals made by various stakeholders. At our last sitting, we completed clause 15. At least that's where we were. And um, we were to continue those discussions. Um, so I think at this point, we may want to look at clause 15 again as our, um, the legal officer from the ministry, from the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport was asked to look at the procurement, um, to look at the public sector procurement regulation 2008. So Ms. Grant, um, I think we may want to just look at that now before we go on to clause 16. All right, so without further delay, let's get to work. Ms. Grant? Yes, Minister, I'm here. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, so regulation 36 of the public sector procurement regulations 2008. I was asked to look at it in relation to the disclosure of interest that we were discussing relative to clause 15 of the bill and just to compare it to see the intent there and if we would want to expand what we currently have. This was on the heels of the suggestion made by the Norma Mandel Law School that a suggestion they made that disclosure of interest should be done prior to to a sitting so as not to delay proceedings. So though I'd circulated it to, well, Mrs. McCarthy circulated it to all 
I'm going to just read the regulation again. But before I read the regulation, what I will say is that, no, let me read it first. All right, so Regulation 36 says it is the duty of any public officer directly or indirectly involved with the procurement process and particularly in the preparation of bidding documents, evaluation, contract negotiations, and contract management and payments to A, declare to the head of his entity or chairman of the entity's procurement committee any potential conflict of interest in relation to a proposed government contract B, declare to the head or chairman any relationship with a bidder, supplier, contractor, or consultant, and refrain from taking part in either the decision-making process or the implementation of any prospective government contract where such a relationship exists. And two says, any personal relationship shall be disclosed in writing or if in a meeting, orally, and then minuted, and any person who has made such a disclosure of personal relationship shall not sit in any meeting while deliberations on the subject matter are being conducted. And then it goes on to speak to a conflict of interest as it relates to the hiring of firms. That's three and four, which I don't think is relevant to our discussion. But let me just go down to five, which says in this regulation, a personal relationship means consanguinity or affinity up to the third civil degree. So having read it and comparing what we have now in the bill, I think what is there is certainly a bit more explicit than what we have as it relates to who disclosure is made to or to whom disclosure should be made how it is done if it's raised in a meeting the fact that if it's said orally then it is minuted and I think it would do us well to take bits and pieces of what regulation 36 has and merge it with what we currently have in clause 50 so I will stop there minister okay now in in this the procurement, um, it makes reference to um, to declare to the head or chair the relationship. So um, in, in reviewing this um, members and um, the legal team, the technical team here, it takes me back to clause 12, where we had, um, I don't know if Hansard or Miss McCartney would recall what was the decision on clause 12. Um, but clause 12 would, um, indicate the board and the, the, the tribunal and its composition. Am I right, Ms. Grant? Yes, Minister. So if we were to look at, if we were to look at what is being recommended here for the public sector procurement regulation, um, clause 36, the if we are looking at having more than one hearing ha happening simultaneously, we may need to review clause 12 and determine how the panel would be structured and possibly looking at an overall chair and two vice chairs, similar to the JADCO um, appeals, the, the JADCO disciplinary panel Jamaica Anti-Doping Commission and the independent panel, the in, independent disciplinary panel, which has an overall chair and two vice chairs, which would facilitate simultaneous, simultaneous hearing. And then the two vice chairs could declare interest to the chair and the, the chair declare interest to the minister. I'm just putting that on the table for a discussion. I don't know if... Um, 
anyone from the technical team would wish to comment or Minister Chuck, if you would wish to comment. And I'm gonna ask you that when you're commenting, if you could be on camera as this is being carried um, live by PBCJ and we would want to be able to see the person speaking. For we'll participating this afternoon. So I'm and inviting really you. Um, comments, I'm, I'm still, um, Um, you're hearing me? I'm not hearing anyone. Yes, we're hearing you, Chair. Yes. So, um, a bit better than before. So, yes. Right. So, I'm inviting comments at this point. Um, I don't know if it was clear what I was um, stating, what I was putting on the table for discussion. Georgia? Minister. Yes, please go ahead. You were, um, for clarification before I come in further. Yes. Are you saying that um, we, the, we could have simultaneously three panel, three panels sitting that when um, Similar to that of the um, the anti-doping, yes, the anti -doping. And to facilitate this, yes, it would be naming an overall chairman and two vice chair. Yes, that's right. That's what I'm oh, saying. That, and and, and right. in, in addition to and that, that now what it would do would, would um, have the two vice chairs declare interest to the chair and then the chair declare interest to the minister. Very well. It would mean a review of clause 12 um, to make those adjustments and to um, take from, from the Public Sector Procurement Regulation 2008, elements that we would incorporate now into clause, into clause 15. That is what um, I'm putting on the table. I don't know if Miss, Miss Grant would want to expand on what I'm saying because we had a little discussion prior to the meeting on that and um, uh, Mr. Siblis, MP Siblis, you could make your comment and others. So, right. uh, yeah, go ahead, Ms. Grant, and then uh, MP Siblis. So what I was saying in, in line with where the discussion ended in our last meeting was that Clause 15, as it is now, when compared to Regulation 36, it could benefit from an expansion. So our Clause 15 has that... You should declare interest by notice, disclose the nature of your interest at a sitting of the tribunal and not take part in any deliberation or any decision and how you are to, when, when you give your notice, it's sufficient disclosure and you don't attend when you make a disclosure and, and so on and so forth. Regulation 36 is a bit more explicit in saying that if you have and they define it as personal relationship in the regulation. But, and it would be the same thing for our purposes here. So if you have a conflict of interest, then you disclose the conflict of interest. It, it details the person to whom you, you express that you have this, this conflict of interest. Uh, we don't have that as it is now in, in how we have worded this clause. There is no mention of whom the disclosure to be, to whom one should make a disclosure if you recognize that there is a conflict of interest. So I was saying, as it relates to that, I think section 15 could benefit from an expansion there. And it goes on to say that if in a sitting, we were also making the distinction the last time we met between a sitting and a hearing. So we were saying that a sitting, when we have a sitting, that the members of the tribunal are meeting and that at the hearing, is it's, it's when the matter is being heard so if at a sitting when they 
matter is brought up and, and, and members are brief, you recognize that you have a conflict of interest, then you it is noted orally and minuted, subsequent to which you don't appear when the hearing takes place. So that is also provided for in Regulation 36, which we don't have so expressly set out in or Clause 15. So I think it would benefit from an expansion in relation to those two things. Chair, can I... Um, can I... Senator Gail, I think um, MP Sibley is wanting oh, to, to make sorry. a comment now. MP Sibley, or we go with Senator Gail? I'll in Chair. I'll yield to Senator Gail. Oh, okay. We, you are so kind. <laughs> Chair, let, let us work it in terms of the sequence, because I can understand the application of clause 36. And I'm using the Industrial Disputes Tribunal now, where the acceptance that there may be a conflict of interest might be known when a brief is submitted because the brief provides a detail of the case. What I'm a little unclear is whether or not the declaration of that conflict of interest arises when you have the sitting itself, the first sitting, then it forms the record that I, Kavan Gill, being a member of the panel of the, um, the tribunal is disclosing that there's a conflict of interest. So the question is, Ms. Grant, as to when that declaration is made. The second part that Chair, you made reference to is the, what is contained in clause 12 now, where clause 12 appoint, speaks to the appointment of the chairperson. And we had discussions about the composition of the tribunal and whether or not we have different divisions or panels of the tribunal. And like in the industrial disputes tribunal, there's a chairman or chairperson and deputy chair. And in that case, if a disclosure or a declaration is made, I agree with you that it goes to the deputy chairs who so happen to be chairing the panel. But if it's the chairman, then the chairman ought to make that declaration to the minister. The only gray area in my mind is the question of when the declaration is made and how will it be recorded? Is it at the first sitting or is it prior to when that member becomes aware? And maybe Ms. Grant, if you could respond. Yes, Ms. Grant, and I see the Solicitor General here. She's in meeting as well. So she may wish to guide us as well, but go ahead, Ms. Grant. Minister, I, I see MP Davis's hand up. I don't know if you want to take her before me. Yes, please go ahead, MP Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my comment is in relation to clause 15 and to address the point just raised by Senator Gale, because my understanding was really that a sitting is different from a hearing and that the sitting presupposes that it is a meeting between the members before the actual hearing. So to my mind, it could very well be that the members of the tribunal will have a sitting, and I'm using that word as in 15A. And it is at that point I envision that the interest will be declared. And so if, you're, if you declare the interest at that point, you won't become a part of the pairing which would involve the parties. I don't know if that is what Senator Gale was alluding to when he made his comment earlier. Senator Gale, go ahead. I, I, you see, there is a, 
in, in the, at the IDT, the sitting is what hears the dispute, right? And, uh, but the, the panel, I would make the assumption that they would meet prior to the sitting. So if it's a distinction between sitting and hearing, I just want to, for it to be written in such a way that it is so explicitly defined as to when the declaration is made. Uh, Ms. Grant? Yes, Minister, I agree with Senator Gale as to defining where the declaration is made. I, I also agree with what MP Davis said, uh, but we certainly could make things a bit more, leave out the speculation as to, because even though A says it, it speaks to a city, that's 15A, 15.2 then goes on to say a notice given by a member at a hearing of the tribunal to the effect to that the member is interested in any matter before the tribunal. So it can it can confuse someone. So I guess it would be good for us to be to be very pointed in at what time point in time is the disclosure made? If it's at the city or if it's before the hearing or what? So we, we seek some guidance here um, as to the sitting or the hearing or um, anyone from the technical team would wish, wish to. Uh, okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, yes. Chair. Chair, can't we just say that it, the, the, the disclosure must be made prior to the hearing rather than trying to distinguish whether it should be a sitting or a hearing? Just use language which would indicate that the the sitting, the disclosure will be made prior to the hearing of the matter before the, the tribunal. Senator Gale? I have no difficulty in that because what it tells us is that the, 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 um, the aggrieved parties would even know if whether or not someone, a member has a conflict of interest once it's sorted out prior to. So it becomes a non-issue after that. So I'm in agreement with that. But what if the sitting, which happens before the hearing, um, that person is involved in certain decisions, even in relation to an input in what the panel would be, that is it, um, hearing the matter. Um, is they, they could declare interest after all of that is, uh, is arranged prior to the hearing. So, so, the, so, so the, if, if we sit into panels and a, a panel is assigned a particular case and upon reviewing the matters contained in, in relation to that particular case, it is the obligation of a member then to declare the interest or the conflict of interest. That can be done before any hearing or sitting or any meeting. But that, that is going to invite the, the, the proceedings to commence. So and, and, and I think that is what we are trying to achieve. That the, 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 the declaration is made so that nobody can question, no party involved in the matter can question the conflict of interest because that would have been declared before and the individual who, was, who would have made that de declaration would recuse themselves. Um, so, um, Mr. Seeley Brown, the, the sitting would be the occasion on which the panel would be determined. Am I correct? Well, <laughs> That will that will that will depend on the on the the procedure that the tribunal adopts, um, chair. So I am not. I, I don't know if we need to get so granular with, in relation to um, what it's at the sitting or the hearing. I think if we use language which says prior to the hearing, it, let us even say it happens that during the hearing, 
um, you realize that you may have a conflict of interest. You can always recuse, there can always be provisions for you within the rules for you to recuse yourself from the hearings. I, this is something that I have seen in other legislation and they have not gone into the, the fine point as to, you know, um, when exactly the decision must be taken and, and, and I think those things will be governed by procedures that, um, that the tribunal, rules that the tribunals may make, may make to, to, to guide itself. So I think um, using language which sufficiently um, would indicate that you must declare if you have an interest prior to, and if even during the hearing you, you, you realize as the hearing is going on that you may have an interest in the matter, then you, you recuse yourself from the hearing. Provision can be made for, 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 um, for that. I, I see, thank you. I see um, MP Angela Brownberg stand up and Senator Bain. So I'll take MP Brownberg and then Senator Bins. And remember- we Okay, you. okay. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Chair. I am glad for Mrs. Cecilia Brown's um, contribution just now, because as I looked at 15, and um, I was also looking at two, three, and four, um, as a plus two, three, and four as well, it goes into quite a bit of um, discussion as to whether um, a notice given by the member at a hearing is sufficient and um, that the member need not attend in person at the hearing, which meant that, uh, well, which would suggest that the idea was for the person to have been present. Yeah, um, I, I believe that especially in the environment in which we operate in terms of um, building trust, not saying low trust, but building trust, that we want to make sure that the language is sufficiently clear about how that is to be handled. I suspect that 15-4, where the minister is satisfied that a member of the tribunal is unable to carry the duties as a member properly and effectively because of a conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest in the matter that the minister shall replace that member or direct that member. I'm assuming that that is standard, but I wanna make sure that how it is worded, it does not give the impression that a member was not um, transparent enough to have identified the conflict or potential conflict and take the remedial steps at the same time. So in how all of that is framed, I want to make sure that those um, are taken into consideration. Thank you. Senator Bins. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I am happy for the intervention of Mrs. Cedar Brown because that is where I was heading as well. I wondered whether it was necessary for us to make a distinction or go into that detail between sitting as opposed to hearing. Because in my mind, the objective is to ensure that where a conflict or a potential conflict arises, then the member of the tribunal indicates that at the soonest time. And if that is the objective, then I wondered whether we could not just have a phrase that speaks specifically to conflict of interest and declaring same as soon as it comes to the person's attention, whether it is going to be to the chairman um, or to the deputy chairman, whoever is leading at the time, instead of trying to separate between what a sitting is as opposed to what a hearing is. Because the truth is that you may not have a sitting. You may just go straight into a hearing. You may get the documents and you decide to have a hearing. Um, so I don't know if we should really... Where, whereas I appreciate the conversation and the discussion, I don't know if we should delve into that kind of granular detail in terms of differentiating between a sitting and a hearing, but just accept that once a conflict arises, a conflict of interest arises, or a potential conflict that the persons indicate seem at the soonest point to the chairman. Thank you, Senator. I see Senator Longmore, please go ahead. Senator Longmore. Senator Longmore, I see your hand up. All right, I think Senator Longmore. Um, all right, so, um, so we, um, 
Senator Longmore, we're not hearing you. Senator Longmore, I see you are, oh, you're having technical issues. Okay, so as soon as you're able to get on, we will take your comment. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Ms. Grant to, um, Minister, I see the soldier has her hand up. Um, okay. Oh, yes, Solicitor General, please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair, and good afternoon, members and colleagues. Just wanted to endorse what Mrs. Celia Brown from OPC had said. Um, don't really have much more to add, but since, um, just to let you know that I would support fully what the OPC has said. So the, the question of to whom the deputy chair, to whom the chair would declare interest, um, would take you back to something I had put forward. The, de the deputy chair would declare interest to the chair, but to whom would the chair, because we, that has not been taken into consideration. Um, so I welcome comments in this regard. Go ahead, SG. I think you, if you wanted to comment on that. No, I had lowered my hand actually, but um, I'm not sure if all of those details really need to be included um, in the bill because these are some procedural matters that are usually left to the tribunals when with the tribunal when they're going to do their rules. Um, I suspect they're supposed to be doing their rules. Um, and those would be made public. Normally, we usually ask them to gazette those rules. And I would, I would say we leave it to that process. So, um, so you're saying that normally uh, declaring interest uh, is determined based on the procedures that are established, as opposed to having it in the legislation. Right. So the legislation would have some basic guidance, which you, we already have. But to go further into some of this, what I would say is more granular, I would say this should be left then to the procedural rules that the tribunal will establish because it is going to be almost impossible for the legislation to be able to prescribe all the different event eventualities. So I would say leave it to the tribunal when they are establishing their rules. But you would still have the very basic guidance in the act. Thank you, SG. So, uh, Ms. Grant, can you, Ms. Grant, can you recap um, the decision that we're now um, taking or we're making here? Okay, Minister. So, that you make a disclosure prior to the hearing, so we're not going to make the distinction you just 15 will say that the disclosure is to be made prior to the hearing and if even while the matter is going on um, where you recognize that there is a conflict of interest or a potential conflict you can recuse yourself from such a matter and the issue of to whom the disclosure is to be made we're going to leave that to the latitude of the tribunal to prescribe when they make their procedural rules Thank you. All right, now, um, can we go proceed now to look at, Ms. Grant, you want us to just proceed now to look at the other clauses? Picking up on clause, is, are, are all the members satisfied where we have reached with clause 15? I, I hear or see no objection, so we- yes, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm good. Thank you, man. So we will move on to, you know, I still have not a response to my suggestion about how going back to 12, how, because as it is now, we speak out of a chair and a deputy chair, but um, we'll move on, on um, for the time being, go back to that. So we go now to clause, 
clause 16 on to 17, because I see there were no suggestions there. On clause 16, Ms. Grant, can you take it from here, please? Thank you. Sure, Minister. So as you rightly said, clause 16, there were no suggestions. So then clause 16 remains as is. Clause 17, that speaks to acting appointments. Only one suggestion was made, and it was made by Minister of Labor and Social Security. And they proposed that a review of the provision for the minister to appoint any person to act in place of the chairperson or any other member of the tribunal as the la because the latter part of the clause only spoke to the chairperson. They noted also that the use of the words appoint any person to act would seem to suggest that such a person would not have to meet the specific eligibility criteria so to act. So they just wanted that distinction to be made as it relates to Clause 17. Ms. Grant, continue, unless we have comments, move on to. Well, Minister, we need to make a decision on 17 if we're going to let it stay or if we're going to give any credence to the suggestion that was made. So let me go again. The suggestion that was made from Ministry of Labor, Clause 17 speaks to appoint acting appointments. So the minister may appoint any person to act in the place of the chairperson or any other member of the tribunal in the case of the absence, inability, or refusal of the chairperson to act. So MLSS said that this clause, they're proposing for a review of the provision for the minister to appoint any person to act in the place of the chairperson or any other member of the tribunal, not just necessarily to the chairperson, and further that the usage of the words appoint any person to act would seek to suggest that such a person would not have to meet the specific eligibility criteria to act. So, Chair? Yes? It is, it is twofold. First, we have to deal with, in addition to the chairperson acting, the same application to a member, if a member becomes incapable of you know, taking up the duties or operating. So the same thing that applies to the chairman or the chairperson must apply to the member. And I, I would want to agree with the Ministry of Labor where the appointment of any person, because we were very specific in the criteria for the appointment of members of the tribunal. So it can't just be left up to any person, the appointment of any person, but to align it to those specific criteria. Um, I'm going back to um, Solicitor General, please assist me in this regard in relation to the appeals tribunal that exists with the independent disciplinary panel for JADCO. It's specific as to the criteria to be to be vice chair. And, and one of the vice chair or the vice chairs would be eligible to chair a panel for a hearing um, in addition to the overall chair. Um, is there a difficulty that we could look at that structure and have that structure in place since we expect to have um, simultaneous hearings at time. And this is going back now to, to how class 12, how we would structure the tribunal. We have specific criteria for members anyway. Um, and in the JADCO, the independent disciplinary panel, there are specific criteria for who would chair a panel. So is this something we could look at or you're not recommending we go there at all? Um, no, this is something that you could consider. Um, I think it's more for the drafter to, to guide as to if we have an idea of if this is something you want to address, then it would be for the drafter to just give you an idea of how it could be addressed. It's more a policy issue. Yeah, but 
why I'm saying this is because one, we want to be able to, to have more than one panel. Um, we also want to ensure that it's not just anybody on the panel, although there are specific criteria for members of the panel, anybody on the panel who would be selected to chair a panel, usually um, with JADCO, there are specific criteria who would be selected to chair a panel. So I'm just putting this on the table for us to, to look at and to be guided, um, to be guided by by the technical team as to if this is something that we should consider at all. So, and, and see, Mrs. Celia Brown has her hand up, but just to say, it already says that an attorney is the chair. So I think if there's going to be any replacement, it would be with another attorney. Um, and if that is not very clear, then we would have to make that clear. If there is supposed to be any other criteria, um, I don't see a difficulty with that, but I see Mrs. Celia Brown wanted to come in, so I will defer to her. Yeah, I see Mrs. Brownberg as well, whose hand was up for a while. But we'll be limiting ourselves to having only two hearings at a time. We're talking about, um, I can't recall, but we, we have a chair and a deputy chair who are attorneys. Um, Mrs. Brown Burke, and then afterwards I'll ask Ms. Cedar Brown, and then Ms. Davis, MP Davis. Please go ahead, um, MP Brown Burke. Mm -hmm. MP Brown Burke? Angela, okay, we'll take Miss Davis and then we'll take Miss Celia Brown. No, I'm sorry. I think I just had my hand up. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry about that. All right. Um, go ahead, MP Brownberg. No, I'm good. I'm good at this point. Uh okay, Mrs. Celia Brown, please go ahead. Um yes, Jay. Um, I just want to make one correction before we I give you what my views are in respect to um, the query raise. There needs to be a slight amendment to clause 17. It should read, the minister may appoint any person to act in the place of the chairperson or any other member of the tribunal in the case of the absence, inability or refusal of the chairperson or the other member to act. So insert after chairperson or the other member, because we're speaking of two instances here where the chairperson, um, is absent or he has is, is unable or refuses to act or in another, another member. So we need to just um, insert those words at the end of clause 17, but well not at the end, just after the word chairperson. Okay. And yes, um, usually you may find in some provisions in law that where you are replacing um, a member who is for, for these um, for this for these reasons um, set out here that you may say, you may use words to the effect that the person who is appointed to act must have the same qualifications as a member who he is, who is who he's acting for. So that's fine. Once that is the policy, we can insert a subclause to, to say that in the legislation. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Celia Brown. Um, uh, MP Bromberg, see your hand up. I'm sorry, I thought I had removed it. I'm very sorry about that. Okay, thank you. All right, I will ask Miss um, Miss Grant to continue her presentation. I don't know. If, I don't uh, know. If MP Davis, Minister, still wanted to make her point. Her hand was up. MP Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My hand was in fact up, <laughs> but I think uh, the question has already been answered because I, when I looked at uh, Clause 17, I immediately turned to Clause 12.1. And I, well, it was just answered by the Solicitor General when she said that it is really accounted for when we use 12.1 to say who would be appointed as a chairperson. And then in addition to the other members, the amendment that is being suggested 
would remedy whatever difficulties would arise. I need to put my hand up faster. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, thank you, Davis. So we will ask um, Ms. Grant to continue her presentation. Well, Minister, just before we continue, I just want to make sure we are, we're in agreement with the insertion of the subclass two about the meeting the specific criteria, the same criteria for initial election to serve. Yes, that is the understanding. Okay. Yes. Sorry, Chair, Chair, send yes, it along more here. Are you hearing me? Yeah, um, hello? Oh, yes. yes. Is this um, Senator Longmore? Longmore, yes, yes, Chair. I see clear connectivity is an issue, so my video is off. Oh, is it? So So we won't be able to see your beautiful face. <laughs> not today, Chair, not today. Okay. Maybe I'll okay. try if, if okay. I'm able to. The viewers on PVCJ won't see your face. All right, <laughs> no problem. Please go ahead and make your input. Yes, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So this, because I, I lost, I lost um, contact with the conversation. Um, the, the insertion that is being contemplated is regarding the, the, the appointment of the panels or the sub, the sub, the sub groups, um, that would review the, the, the specific cases. Yes, it's in relation to the panel that would deal with the case and, um, okay. yes. Okay. And the final decision was around the structure was, uh, as you had proposed, with the chair and two deputies? No, as a matter of fact, I've not had a response to, to that suggestion. What I understand is being proposed, we go, go ahead with the chair and the deputy chair, but in oh. the case where any member is selected to chair, the mm -hmm. criteria should be similar to, to that of the chair. Am I, am I correct, Ms. Grant? That is, that's what is being put forward? Well, Minister, as it relates to the chair and the deputy chair, that would take us back to Clause 12. And I believe you had said that we would go ahead with the other clauses and then return to that ah. to, get, to get a more concrete. But as it relates to the acting appointments, the decision is that whomever is chosen to act, whether mm -hmm. as chairperson or any other member, that they would have to meet the same initial selection criteria as the other members. Okay, correct. And and the discussion around Senator Gale with, uh, with, with his, disc his discourse around the, the disclosure that would obtain, a, a, that the, the decision is, is that um, we will proceed and the disclosure would be as, as, as it is discovered, prior if to, necessary. Prior to the, to the hearing. Right, okay, all right, fantastic. Thank you, Chair, appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Grant, please. Go ahead. Yes, Minister. So that takes us to 18. 18 remains as is, no suggestions having been made. So we then move on to clause 19. And one suggestion was made by Jamaicans for Justice to say that an element of disqualification they are proposing should be that a provision is included to disqualify any person found guilty of prior acts of sexual harassment. So what we have here, suffering from a mental disorder within the meaning of the Mental Health Act, um, becomes of unsound mind or becomes permanently unable to perform the functions as a member of the tribunal by reason of ill health. We have bankruptcy or an insolvent person and it has, Mm, has at any time been convicted of an offence involving dishonesty or moral turpitude, holds an offence which duties would conflict with functions of the person as a member of the tribunal. And they are suggesting that it be put in there that any person who has committed prior sexual harassment act, that they be disqualified from serving. Uh, but then, uh, Minister, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Mrs. Celia Brown can guide me if that insertion even needs to be made, having 
regard to the fact that paragraph C says, has at any time been convicted of an offense, even though sexual harassment is not an offense, though, involving dishonesty or moral turpitude, but the usage of the moral turpitude would, to my mind, take care of the concern of any person who has been involved in any, any sort of acts of sexual harassment. So I, I don't, to my mind, Minister, I don't necessarily think it needs to be made, but I'll be guided by what Mrs. Seeley Brown has to say. Mrs. Seeley Brown, please. Um, I am minded to agree, Chair. I think it would be covered under paragraph C. It speaks to dishonesty and moral turpitude. I'm a little mindful to use that. Um, um, ch chair, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Um, um, I think my personal my personal opinion and and possibly how we hope for the act in my mind to be perceived is is that we make a clear statement and we explicitly state because the the the, the breach of moral turpitude might be the fact that they that they would choose to serve and not disclose. So maybe you know conducting moral turpitude and having evidence of it i think we there's still room to to to, to not declare etc cetera, etc cetera, but and still be present so i think that explicitly stating it and and for the law and and as 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 a stance that we want the legislation to reflect that that would uh, that is absolutely not tolerated i would i would actually i would actually include it it doesn't hurt if there's a if there's a damage to it being or potential of a damage or it being m m misused in any way, I would definitely remove it. But I think that it could serve a purpose to have it explicitly stated too. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Senator Longhorn. Um, any further comments on this? Um, Senator sure, Gale, sure. Gale, sorry, sorry, Senator Gale. Would you want to go ahead for Senator Gale before I speak? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, I'm just looking at the, the dictionary definition of turpitude, which speaks of depraved or wicked behavior or character. And I'm thinking that that is wide enough to include any, any, any act of sexual harassment. So I, 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 I again... Because we, we do not have, do we have, my, my, my only issue is because it speaks to shall not become or continue to be a member. When we are looking for persons to sit on this tribunal, initially, what benchmark are we going to use um, to determine whether or not that person has been convicted of, a, of, 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 of an act of, not convicted, sorry, been found guilty of an act of, of, of sexual harassment. And so I would caution against using that particular type of language in the legislation because I think that once you can prove that um, it, it, it can it can be covered under the def the, 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 the ordinary definition of moral turpitude. We may want to have them sign um, some kind of written problem. Possibly. Or or I was gonna I was gonna suggest that but I didn't want to get too detailed in the legislation to say that you can actually put in provisions which would deal with fit and proper person. And, yes. and set up like how we have done in other legislation. If we can do that too at the beginning, opposition, you, you, we can do that. Um, so, so, so that's another option. I, I keep referring to the JADCO legislation because they, they have to sign. Yes. 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 So that is um, something we could look at. Um, MP Brownberg and, and oh, Senator Gale and MP Brownberg. No, it was actually MP Brownberg before me. Okay. Because <laughs> I want to hear what she's going to say. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. thanks. No, um, I was just, um, I, I believe that it's more than just sexual harassment, you know, in terms of uh, what should be included in uh, the consideration for fit and proper to serve on the tribunal. So I would not want us to narrow and specifically pick out sexual harassment because any other sexual offenses, for example, for me would, would have been a red flag. And so I would want to see it 
um, defined broadly enough to clearly cover these things. Um, I am uh, assuming from what Mrs. Silbrown said that uh, offenses involving dishonesty or moral turpitude is uh, um, clear enough in the legal jargon and would have been understood to include things like this. But I think it's important to make sure that that is so. But I wouldn't want to single out sexual harassment when there are so many other um, sexual offenses or other um, related matters that would also be a challenge if a member were sitting who would have been um, found guilty or um, involved in any of that prior to, to being a member of the board, of the tribunal. Thank you, MP Bumber. I'll take Senator Gale and then the Solicitor General. Chair, I, I am of the view that C really covers what a, a broad range of issues um, that can be captured. The only other thing that we may do is um, before they are appointed, if they can go through that checklist, but that checklist is just a meter to, for, to gauge whether someone is going to be truthful or not. Because they can say they have never, I would never be able to prove it. And it may have happened decades ago. So I'm, I'm of the view that C covers it enough, sufficiently. Okay, um, Solicitor General, please go ahead. Thank you, Senator Gale. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just on that same point, if we start listing, we're going to have an issue with interpretation. So if we start out by speaking of moral turpitude and then we go on to speak about um, offenses of a, say, sexual harassment nature, it could qualify the whole meaning of moral turpitude. This is the reason usually it's just left in and of itself, it covers a wide range of issues. It covers offenses of a sexual nature, which are not necessarily um, just sexual harassment. It uncovers anything that is seen as degrading, especially for our society um, of a certain type of immoral sort of behavior. Um, if we start to list, then if it comes for interpretation, the question will be posed. If this is included, does it mean it didn't include this? And I think then it may actually restrict the whole interpretation of moral turpitude. It's a, it's a regular feature in our laws, um, in both regulatory laws as well as those laws that are more of a, um, of a criminal nature as well. So I would suggest that we... I would suggest that C is wide enough to be maintained as is because it would cover... The, any of any offense under the sexual harassment law, which we now have, as well as a wider range of offenses, even not sexual in nature. Thank you, SG. Thank you so much. Um, I see Senator Longmore. Wanted to thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. And so I, I'm appreciative of getting the response to my question in terms of whether or not the presence of it would actually impact, and I'm hearing um, especially the legal uh, ramifications of it. But my, my just to just to, to not belabor the point, but I think that it's it it gives a statement of when it's explicitly stated, the individual who is being contemplated for that position is conscious more of it, and it would be it is it is I'm hoping that the body um, is is reflect it. It could be a great opportunity to convey this to the public and to the to the to the citizen to citizenship um so if it is covered and it is good no problem um but sexual harassment the individual might not be guilty of it now in the moment but it is it is the thought process and the interaction that sometimes goes with it that may not be at that time identified so but i'm happy to to, to accept um as suggested thank you thank you senator okay. um, MP Siblis, you wanted to make a comment? Yes, I, I, I can see where Senator 
Longmore is coming from. And I understand, but um, the what Solicitor General to expand on Solicitor General point of view is to say that in in the in, in the le in in law and our um, interpretation of the law may happen inside the court once you start to list items, specific things to go along with a general um, word, then the court will um, interpret that we only mean um, sexual offenses. And then if there is any other demeaning things that happen, you, you would want to find it difficult to convince the court otherwise. So I, I understand Senator Long when I, I, I can understand and, and I concur with the reason, but it may pose some sort of difficulty in the, in the long run. Thank you, MP, thank you, appreciate it, thanks. Uh, thank you, um, MP Sibley. Uh, Mr. Witter, MP Witter, you wanted to make a comment? MP Witter, did you want to make a comment? All right, so I think that we, what what have we agreed to? Uh, Ms. Grant, do you want to just summarize where you think we are with this position, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, Minister, that Clause 19 needs to be left as is, and we are not to restrict, as it were, the meaning of um, moral turpitude. We, we don't want to get ourselves into a position where it does not cover a broad range of offences. So that is that's the essence of the discussion that I have gathered, that we're leaving 19 as is, because paragraph C is sufficient. Right. Agreed, members. All right, so, uh, Ms. Grant, could you continue, please? Just to say along that line, as I continue, Minister, that the insertion of the fit and proper yes. provision to how panelists are initially selected, that that was also something that was, that was discussed and agreed on for the most part. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much. Could you continue, please? Yes, ma'am. So the, we're at Clause 20 now, which deals with revocation of appointments. Let me just read what is here. It says the minister may revoke the appointment of any member of the tribunal for the inability of the member to discharge the functions as a member of the tribunal, whether arising from infirmity of body or mind, dereliction of duty, misbehavior, or for any of the circumstances arising under Section 19. MLSS had this to say about clause 20. They are proposing that consideration be given to the use of the words infirmity of body or mind to ensure that it's not construed in such a way to allow for discrimination against persons with disabilities, which would be in breach of the Disabilities Act as well as the Mental Health Act. And also a proposal that the term misbehavior in this clause might be a bit too subjective. Do we have any comments here? You know, you know, Chair. Go ahead, Senator Gale. Chair, my only concern was the infirmity of body. I, when I looked to it, that was, I, I, I drew a line through it in my um, bill because infirmity of body mean, can mean that you're not fit, you're frail, and so forth. Does this disqualify you where your mind is sharp? You might not be quick on the heels. You might not be as agile as once, but would it disqualify you from performing your duties? Uh, 
that was just my concern with this particular, that particular part of it. Chair. Yes, please go ahead. I was just, I was just want to remind us again, making the same point, reiterating the same point that um, Mrs. Aldred made a while ago, that these terms are terms that are used, not just in this legislation, but if you check the Integrity Commission Act, any act that establishes a board or a tribunal, we have used these terms which have particular meaning in law and to even change it here or, or, or try to make any adjustments, it mirrors issues, not just in this legislation, but in all of the other legislation that we have used this particular term. Just, just, just a caution. Okay, thank you for that note. This is Celia Brown. Um, Senator Gale. Um, I would assume that you. I, I was only seeking clarity, you know, and I and I've received the clarity. I am very obedient. <laughs> All right, um, Solicitor General, you may go ahead. Thank you for being obedient, Senator Gale. Um, thank you. Thank you. Just to sort of reinforce the point, the the phrase actually comes from the Constitution. And it has been judicially under judicial scrutiny before. Um, but another word of caution in terms of trying to alter this. It is expected now we have basic rules of what's called Winsbury's rules of reasonableness. If a minister is going to act, the minister is expected to act in a reasonable manner. So you could have a tribunal member who does suffer from, who is suffering from, um, some illness but you realize that the person can still perform their duties it is expected that the minister is going to act in a reasonable manner and would not revoke the appointment and if the minister acted in an unreasonable manner the minister can be held accountable it is there though because there are instances where persons are so ill they are unable to perform and there are times when those persons are are they're, they're not cognizant, perhaps, of the fact that they are not really performing their duties. Maybe it is that they're hoping that they will, you know, improve in their health. And there are times when they may not voluntarily, voluntarily resign. You need to still retain that power to be able to revoke the appointment in such a case. Thank you, Solicitor General. All right, Miss... Um... Grant? Yes, Minister, I am here. Right. So Clause 20 remains it's as is. Clear. It's very clear to you where we're going with that. Yes, Minister, I was always of the opinion that it need not be changed, but I am just reading what they think here, what they say here. But so Clause 20 remains as is. Thank you. Please go ahead. Please continue. Okay. Just for the record, Clause 21. Uh, yes, clause 21. Only one suggestion was made here by the private sector organization of Jamaica. And the point is really to say that appointments relating to how vacancies should be filled should meet the overall standards set out in clause 11. So 21, I think this is covered. I, I, I don't think anything else needs to be done i think what we have here is sufficient but i will read it nonetheless 21 says if any vacancy occurs in the membership of the tribunal such vacancy shall be filled by the appointment of a person who shall subject to the provisions of this part hold office for the remainder of the period for which the previous member was appointed so however that the appointment shall be made in the same manner and from the same category and gender of persons as the appointment of the previous member. They, and they're saying that the appointment of vacancy should meet the overall standards set out in section 11. The usage of the words here shall be made in the same manner to my mind to cover that concern. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Any comments? So we all agreed. Proceed, Ms. Grant, please. 
Okay, Melissa. 22, which is where we are now, which speaks to 22 and 23. I deal with this because no suggestions were made on either of the two clauses. So those two clauses also remain as is. Which takes us now on to 24, which speaks to the staff of the tribunal. This too, I think, should remain as is. No, you left out 23? Yes, that's because no suggestions were made. So I said 22 uh, and can 23. I, can I, I, can I, yeah, there's, a, there's something I want to clarify on 23. Okay. There shall be paid to the chairperson and other members of the tribunal in respect of each hearing. Now it's specific in terms of each hearing. A remuneration, whether by way of honorarium, salary or fees. Now, salary is treated a little differently in terms other than fees, especially in the public sector. And if someone expects and anticipates that a salary will be paid, in the connection with the salary being paid for each sitting, uh, sorry, each hearing. I don't know if we can get a distinction because I, I want a member to believe that they are going to be paid a salary when the payment is applicable for the hearing independently. So I don't know if we, we need to make a distinction between salary, fees, honorarium, and separate it. Uh, my question is what is expected here in terms of remuneration? Maybe that's something that we have to ask the Ministry of Public Service, Chair. Well, they have said but I, I would just want us to be clear in terms of what would be the expectation of the member. Well, are we treating it as salary or fees or are we treating it as an honorarium? Well, the payment is for each, is in respect of each hearing. Yes. But I'm not sure if a payment for each hearing will constitute it being characterized as a salary. Well, we meet, need to be guided here by, by our technical team. How is it treated in other legislation? Well, uh, while my other colleagues get ready to respond, Minister, I was just having a look at, for example, the JADCO legislation and I looked in particular at, which schedule is this now? Schedule, the third schedule that relates to the independent anti-doping disciplinary panel. And going down to the section that deals with remuneration, the same kind of language is used. And so I, I hear what Senator Gale is saying, but- Maybe it's standard. Maybe it's standard language. Huh? Yeah. 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 Sorry, if I could interject, um, Chair, if the language is, can you hear me? The language is standard. Um, however, yes, you could check with the Ministry of the Public Service to see if the wording is still current, because from time to time, the wording has changed. But this is a standard language we've been using for a few years, where we speak of honorarium salary fees and by the way with some appeal tribunals they don't get paid necessarily just for a hearing because they may have prep work and they may have need to meet for the prep work for some appeal tribunals like the api appeal tribunal they may have to do what i call a site visit where there are some documents that can't be brought to them they have to meet as a tribunal and go to an entity and review documents so things like that it's not just necessarily um, being paid for a hearing. Um, but I agree that it would not necessarily be considered salary, but I really think that the Ministry of the Public Service should be asked um, to just review this wording and see if it is still acceptable given new current guidelines. 
under our fiscal responsibility framework because this is really their expertise and their area. All right, so um, that will be um, so noted and checked, Senator Gale. Thank you, thank you um, very much. But uh, Ms. Ms. Grant, I just want to go back to clause 20. Um, I, we did not address the term misbehavior, which was being, um, was Minister of Labor and Social Security that made the point that it might be too subjective. Um, what was our position on that? Well, we, we, we didn't refer to it specifically, Minister, so I guess now it's a good time. I, I, I don't think it is subjective. I, I think it is quite clear because it speaks to misbehavior or, or for any of the circumstances are, uh, under Section 19. I don't think it is subjective. Uh, then, then that is my view. All right. Any other comment on this? All right, if there are no comments, we can consider it. Um, there's no change there. Are you hearing me okay? Everyone hearing me okay? Yes, Mr. Okay, thank you. All right, so I um, I can take it that we all agree here. All right, so could you continue, Ms. Grant? That takes us to 24. So the notation has been made as the Solicitor General indicated to check for the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. Right. They, as it relates to 24 now, which is where we are speaking to the staff of the tribunal, one suggestion was made by Jamaicans for Justice that a provision be inserted that the Secretariat for the Sexual Harassment Tribunal is one which enables the tribunal to operate effectively in an independent and impartial manner. That's their suggestion. Personally, I don't think this injection needs to be made. I think that this section is fine as is, but then that's me. Any comments here? I agree with Ms. Grant, um, Chair. All right, thank you, Cecilia Brown. All right, Ms. Grant, could you move on, please? Okay, so 25, making of a complaint. Have quite a few here. MLSS indicated that In relation to cost 25 regarding the making of a complaint that we reconcile the jurisdiction as set out under 13 and also that sec well clauses three sub clause one sub clauses one and two were not referenced in 13 which also speak to the jurisdiction of the tribunal and that was not referenced in 25, so that we reconcile the jurisdictions there in relation to 25 and clause 13 and clause 13 and 3.1 and 3.2. All right, so let me go with 13. Just look here. 13 speaks to the jurisdiction of the tribunal to hear complaints. So they're saying that uh, 13 does not make reference to 25, it speaks to a procedure, well, making of the complaints that there is no reference to 25, and that 3 1 and 3 2. I, I don't understand that either. 3 1 and 3 2. Prevention of sexual harassment. Mm. That three one and three two, oh three one and three two were not referenced. They say in thirteen. Hmm. Not sure about that. All right, so I go on. Um, rent assessment board, and these are the suggestions on the matrix one. Rent assessment board went on to say on their making of complaint that it does not. 
appear to make any provision for children who are harassed who are harassed rather in residential premises or to allow for these children to make complaints either through through an adult or someone else. The IJCHR noted that a complaint form should be set out perhaps in a schedule to enable persons to know what is expected of them and it would also give them guidelines as to how they should complain. So they're, they're suggesting that this be put in a schedule in line with 25, how they should lodge the complaints, how they should complain, and what form they are to use. Of course, the mention was made about the time limit. They suggested that 12 months be extended in cases of sexual harassment by the tribunal similar to what is there in four and five and that regard must be had when you're thinking about extension to the circumstances of the case taking into account the factors surrounding the case the length of delay in lodging the complaint and reasons for delay and the tribunal should consider whether there is an equitable reason to justify not applying the normal limitation period to the case. So they didn't have a problem with the 12 months, but they urge that consideration be given to enlargement of time in certain cases. Norman Manley Law School made the point that the 12 months be extended to three years. They also made the point that enlargement of time be considered depending on the circumstances surrounding why the complaint did not come in time. Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, we're now on Matrix 2, made the comment that the Child Care and Protection Act and the Public Defender Interim Act both include provisions for a complaint to be made by a child, his parent, guardian, next friend, or person in local parentis. And this is not, there is no consideration that is given in this legislation. Matrix 3, they too had a problem with the limitation period, but no suggestion was made. Matrix 3, no useful suggestion was made. So those were the suggestions in relation to Clause 25. I'm inviting comments here. Senator Gale? Um, Chair, so one of the submission made reference to the treating of a minor. And, and I'm of the profound view that in this case, sexual harassing a minor must be treated even stronger than what is contained here. And I'm not sure if the other legislations in terms of the Sexual Offenses Act would treat with those, but it shouldn't be the same reporting and going to a tribunal if a minor is being exposed to sexual harassment anywhere, in any shape or in any form. Um, in terms of the procedures now, I'm not so clear whether or not these procedures make reference to the, those who are renting a property. It speaks to the employer and the employer making the submission and the defined period. But in terms of the, the landlord tenant arrangement, I'm not so clear if it is referenced here in terms of how that submission or that application is to be made. And I was looking back at clause 13 and it speaks to a complaint made by the worker or a claim instituted by a student. I was trying to again make the connection about the landlord tenant arrangement. Um, those would have been my observations, in particular with this, this clause. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Senator Gale. 
um, and, and write other comments. Um, um, Chair? Yes, please. Please go ahead, Senator Lamar. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you now. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm, I'm in agreement with, with Senator Gale's um, recognition um, around the, 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 if this offense is against uh, children or of, of a juvenile mindset, um, you know, yeah. So I think that, I, and not just the, the sexual offenses, but also the Child Care and Protection Act may, may also be applicable in those circumstances, because I think, I think from its a child, it, it is probably not a criminal matter. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Longmore. Uh, Ms. Grant, please go ahead. Yes, Minister, two things. I just wanted to make sure I caught what both senators were saying about the child, that they, it would, we wouldn't make any provisions for, for that, for the reporting of the child on, uh, for an adult to make the report on behalf of the child. I just want to make sure. I got that contribution correct. Well, the, 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 so the issue in terms of the child now, yes, a report has to be made. But I, I'm just simply saying that if a report is made of a child, then in this case, it ought to be supported by another legislation and not left up to this because you're reporting an issue involving a minor. Though it may be sexual harassment or a harassment in any shape or form. And so this alone cannot apply. It must be supported by any other applicable legislation and treated strongly. Yes, yes, Senator Gale. I, I think that I could ask the Solicitor General or Mrs. Cedar Brown uh, because I think this would be supported or covered on the um, another piece of legislation after the minister i will yes. i'd really like i'd like to make my other point after okay. both yes. are finished please go ahead yes oh I, i'll wait until they make their comments minister because my point would take us into another another part of one of the contributions okay so sgr mrs Seeley brown please Yes, Mrs. Celia Brown, go ahead. Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't know how, how um, this requires some thought because um, we already have the Sexual Offenses Act, which deals with, we, I, I don't want us to, to conflict the issue, conflict issues. Sexual harassment is, it, it attaches with its civil liability through a complaint that is made to the, to the, to the tribunal. And, um, you have the Sexual Offenses Act, which would deal with sexual assault and grievous um, sexual assault and, and, and rape and all those other offenses. So I'm not very clear in my mind as to why we are thinking that if a child alleges that that child has been sexually assaulted, um, that would then become an, if, 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 that, if I'm understanding correctly, that should now be treated as a sexual offense under the Sexual Offenses Act. Um, sexual assault is clearly um, outlined um, as um, in, 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 in the Sexual Offenses Act, and I think um, it, can't be, it can't be sexual harassment and then you tie it to sexual offenses. Either it's an offense under the Sexual Offenses Act which attaches criminal liability, or it's sexual harassment which attracts um, civil liability. So, I would require, I, that would require some more thought. I can't, in my mind, I can't see them working the way um, it's being suggested by the committee. I think, though, the question is, 
if a child is sexually harassed, how is that treated? Am I right? Well, if, well, if it's sexual harassment, the only, the, only, the only place it can be treated is in the Sexual Harassment Act. If the child is sexually assaulted, that is a criminal offense. So, so, but, so that, that's the part I'm trying to grapple with. Right, so, but sure. It's a question of, I think the question is, one, can a child be sexually harassed? And two, yeah. child be sexually harassed? Right. How is that treated? Yes, well. Is that under another piece of legislation? No, well, based on the definition of institution, Chair. Based on the definition of institution, institution includes a school. Children are at school, because it says a school, college, university, or other place of learning or training. So a child can either be sexually assaulted or sexually harassed. We have decided when we're speaking of sexual harassment in the workplace at an institution, it attaches civil liability. And when we speak of sexual assault, whether it's at a school or whatever to a child or whatever, it's a, that's, a, that's, that's a criminal offense under the Sexual Offenses Act. So I, I can't see us marrying both together. It's I, to me now, right now, I mean, I will take my guidance from the SG. It's either or. It's either you've been sexually harassed with, and, and if you have been, this act will apply where they, 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 you go to the tribunal and you, you, you have your you redress there. If you've been sexually assaulted, it's a criminal offense and that person is charged and, and tried as, a, you know, under the, sex, under the Sexual Offenses Act. So that's where my mindset is right now, Chair. We need a lot of guidance here because we, we have to determine, can a child be sexually harassed? Yes. And I think this child can be sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. That child could be sexually harassed in an apartment by a landlord or anyone else yes. could be sexually harassed in the school. Yes. How are we going to treat with that? Is this legislation going to ignore it? Or is this piece of legislation going to say that will be treated under something else? Well, the legislation right now, Chair, but in my view, I don't think it has, uh, it has ignored it. Because when you look at the complaints provision, it says a person who alleges contravention of sections five, six, seven, eight, or nine, in which section clause, sorry, clause, hold on a second, clause, if one speaks to institution, um, right, clause eight, which is covered here, speaks to an institution, which can be a school. So that person can, 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 can seek redress through the tribunal because in this act, we have not decided to use the courts. If you remember the previous legislation had some things being tried in the courts and some things being tried, tried by the tribunal. We have decided to use the tribunal and we have decided to attach only civil liability. So this legislation as it stands right now does not ignore if a child is sexually harassed. It doesn't say that if a child is sexually harassed, that child has no redress. That child, somebody, if that child is a minor, somebody can make a complaint on behalf of the, of, of, of the child under the um, to the tribunal so that's the point i'm making if that child is sexually assaulted that's a different issue but you look at the definition remember we are guided also by the definition in course two chair of sexual assault and remember we had we may, we've said that we may even have some tweaking to do because i remember when some i think one of the presentations was made some things may even border because of how it's, it's defined now and, and we may have to tweak it so that it doesn't include in any way or seem to be including anything that relates to sexual assault in the sexual offenses after that reason. So I don't think that a child is shut out for making a complaint under this, this act chair. It's just, I think the concern is that it only attaches civil liability, even if it's a child, because that is the way we have decided. That's the policy behind the legislation as it stands right now. Anything else that is not sexual harassment would be once it is covered, once, once it is in the, in, in, in the sphere of sexual assault or grievous sexual assault, that is dealt with in the sexual offenses. Right? But so, I, mm -hmm. sorry. Celia Brown, this is very clear to us. We're not speaking about sexual assault. Yes. We're speaking about sexual harassment. Yes. A million dollar question, how do we be treated a juvenile in this case, a child? But it, it would be it would be the same in my mind. It would it would it would be by making by that person making a complaint under 
clause 25. It doesn't lock you out of clause, clause 25. Well, that's a question Senator Gale was asking. Yeah, it does. If you treat a child similar to how you would treat an adult in this case, so I think that is what he was putting on yes, the table. But, uh, but, but just to add, just to add, Chair, but I also see some concerns because when you even look at the, when you even look at the awards, Maybe we may have to look at those again to see because it's more skewed towards like an. As Wait, that's where that, that's where I was going. And that's yes. where I was going back to yes. Mrs. Celia Brown. Yes, when I looked at the awards, the awards yes. are skewed towards you know, I mean the employee. Yes, and, uh, I agree. Things like that. So maybe we need to look at the awards themselves yes. and that's to see how we can treat those awards. But yes. you're quite right that it it appears right now it's a civil civil procedure. Yes, it is civil. It is civil. That was the intent. That was the policy intent of this legislation. That it only attracts, it will only attract civil liability for sexual harassment. Well, sorry, I, I was just I was just stoking the fire and I've never seen so many hands raised. That's right. A lot of hands raised and I'm going to take them. So I will start with Senator Longmore, then Senator Bins, then Senator Donna Scott Motley, and then Ms. Grant in that order. Thank you, Mrs. Celia Brown. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of what I, questions that I had were actually addressed, but um, regarding, regarding, I think you were also asking the question as to what, whether or not we, uh, we can, you can actually have a sexual harassment um, offense against a child. And I think we, I think we have to decide whether or not we want to be zero tolerance to sexual crime and 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 sexual and and ex and sexual um sexual 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 innuendos sometimes and whether or not we can say that once a offense is a, is is committed against a child it is a criminal act it, it, for me there should be no civil option when if in the event of 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 that of a child being offended in that way, because I think it's also the message that we want to send with this legislation, that there is, there is no tolerance for, especially on a child, the, the, the foisting of, of sexuality on them or, or exposing unwelcomed by society a, a child to that. So I, I think that it should reflect that. Um, yeah, so I don't know. The real question, as you were asking, Chair, is, can, can can it can it be really an offense to sexually harass versus just straight to um, sexual assault with respect to a, a child? I think that is really the ultimate question. Thank you, Chair. Senator Lamar, Senator Bins. I know to Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I'll get to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, some of my, my questions I'm happy for the discussion before um Senator Longmore because it helped in, in just clarify my own thoughts. But to start off with, I think we are all agreed that a child can in fact be harassed. And I think, Senator Gale, that your concern perhaps is aligned with mine, which is if we agree that a child can be harassed, then does the process that is captured in this bill, is it sufficient for a child? As we have seen, it will be sufficient for an adult. But do we treat a child in the same way as we would treat an adult in terms of the complaint process, the persons involved? I, I was thinking to myself, um, is there a role, for example, for the OCA? And, and I heard a discussion about it not being a criminal offense, and so it has to be treated under this act. But perhaps something special, there needs to be a special carve out for where a child has been sexually harassed. I'm not saying it needs to get a level of um, a criminal offense perhaps, but I am not necessarily saying that and I would not be in, in any disagreement for us to take it that route. But whatever the route is, I believe that there has to be a specific carve out to how we treat with children who are harassed. Is there a role for the Office of the Children's Advocate? Is there a role for Sissoka? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, and perhaps we do not have the answer at this meeting. Maybe it is something that we need to think about. Maybe it's something we need to get some guidance and do some research on. But certainly I believe that the process as captured in this bill is really more adult oriented rather than child oriented. And I think perhaps that was the concern of Senator Gale and that is in fact the concern that I have. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Binns. Um, Senator Scott Motley. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the concerns that I have, can I stop my video? <laughs> I'm not hearing you, Chair. Why are you stopping the video? <laughs> well, one of the concerns that I had was the whole definition of sexual harassment, which in the context in which we were discussing it meant that the, meant the making of an unwelcome sexual advance towards a person. And we were very clear in how we approached it because within the workplace context and the different contexts that we were discussing it, we were aware that there might be times when the sexual advance is not unwelcome. The question which I would uh, like to ask is, can a child fit in that definition? Because children are not allowed to consent, they're not capable of consenting, and so they're not capable, in my view, of determining whether, in other words, we can't attribute to them the definition, which is that a sexual advance would be welcomed in the first place. So I want to hear some thoughts on that. My own view is that it should be a matter that should be examined under legislation which carries a punitive uh, result. And I, I think that we need to consider whether the, it is adequately addressed by the Sexual Offenses Act, for example. Do remember that sexual touching, sexual grooming and other, thing, other offenses are thereby contained. I, my main concern is that we might be extending this legislation of sexual harassment in a direction where it, it ought not to be. Thank you, Senator Scott Motley. Okay, I will now ask um, uh, MP Siblis. He wants yes, to yeah. give input. And then I will, uh, Ms. Grant, you will uh, wait until I take um, MP Davis as well? Or yes, Minister. Will... Okay, fine. So we will go to MP Siblis, then MP Davis and we come back to you, Ms. Grant. All right, good. Yes, Chair. Yeah, please go ahead. I, my mind was from the beginning after reading the bill, it had concerned me about sexual harassment of children. And I've been wondering from that time whether or not this should not be in the in the in the sexual offenses act or other act that is give a criminal offense because I'm in agreement with Senator mortally as it relates to um, sexual harassment in its, in its broadest definition. If um, children can um, consent and there's no way they can. And so I am wondering if is, is, shouldn't there be an amendment to a next act if it is not already there to um, make it be a criminal offense to, to really um, sexually harass a child? That is, to my mind, that is beyond the imagination of a safe society if we, we put in, in a situation where it's, it's 
we are seeing it as a civil matter to sexually harass a child. I, I think it, it goes to that child, the whole mental disturbance to anyone with regard to sexual harassment, more so a child. So I, I, I don't think it, we can conclude on it here, but to take some advice from the um, persons who could do some further research on it, whether or not we couldn't satisfy the prevention of sexual harassment of children, but put it in an act where it rightfully deserves to be. Thank you, MP Siblis, MP Davis. Um, thank you, Chair. Oof. Uh, in on this point, I am more minded to agree with uh, Senator Scott Motley because my first question was, what are the objectives of this bill? Who are we targeting? And I believe from the definition, I had to reread it. And I even just now read the objective to the, to the back of the draft. And it speaks about interfering unreasonably with the work performance, creating offensive or hostile work environment, and so on. So if it is that this is the focus, my view is that the child is adequately addressed or has redress in the Sexual Offenses Act, as well as the Child Care and Protection Act. And I, I quickly ran through section seven, eight, and nine, speaks about grooming. And so if a child is in a position where an adult makes an advance and is uncomfortable, then the proper recourse in my mind is the Sexual Offenses Act. And it would, I believe, address some of the points raised earlier, whether we want to put the harass harassment of a child in this act. I would agree with the, my other colleagues when they say that it should rightly be a part of this act if there were no alternative. But I believe that so far the Sexual Offenses Act has been able to capture the slightest touch, advance, gesture that makes a child uncomfortable. So I think as it is, if we are to honestly agree that the focus of this is to capture those scenarios, the workplace, landlord, tenant, and so on. Then while I agree that a child can be harassed, I, my view is that it must not necessarily be addressed in this act. Thank you, MP Davis. Thank you so much. I will take, um, I will take Senator Scott Motley, then Senator Longmore, and um, Ms. Grant. So go ahead, please, Senator. I think we're still up. I had the point which I wanted to make, which was fundamentally the issue of whether a child can consent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Longmore. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so I think that it is kind of becoming more clear whether it is a criminal versus a civil and i and i saw i'm so happy to see the consensus around the, the zero tolerance um but i i don't want us to to forget um the 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 the, the approach suggested by senator fraser bins too and just to say that legislatively going forward perhaps some of the issues that obtained before with the legislative approach that, that, that was um, brought to us by the technical team, that um, maybe it has to remain in a sense, but we could maybe consider a special carved out group as it obtains to children. Um, so I'm not sure which of those two legislative approaches might be better. And I mean, I, I too, just for the record, underscore that a child cannot consent. So for me, it is an automatic criminal offense. Thank you. Minister, we're not hearing you. 
I'm sorry, Mrs. Celia Brown, please go ahead. Just to add, um, Chair, when we are reviewing, because we have, we remember, remember we had decided that we were going to leave clause two for when we had completed the other provisions to deal with the interpretation section. And I think too, we may have to revisit the definition of sexual advance, paragraph A, which speaks to physical contact of a sexual nature, because that may very well put it into the realm of sexual grooming if you're looking at a child. So I think some tweaks will have to be done to the definition of sexual harassment and the definition of sexual advance if we if we are going the route which I think we're going with respect to children. Um, thank you so much, Mrs. Celia Brown. We really have to um, do that with you. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask Senator Gale if he could. Um, take over from me to chair this meeting as I have to um, join a special cabinet meeting at this time. Senator Gale? Okay, chair. And I ask the members if they so agree? Yes, chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you so Keep much. Keep safe. Keep Sorry, safe. No. Thank okay. you, chair. Only one, only one member said yes, chair. <laughs> well, silence means consent in this case. <laughs> <laughs> no <a> union leader. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, bye, Chair. Uh, All right, Chair. So, Miss, well, I say, Mrs. Seely Brown, your hand is still up. No, I, I meant to take it, and I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So, Miss Grant, back to you then. Let me pee and then. Yeah. Yes, huh? yes, yes, Chair. Okay, I, well, it is clear that we'll have to do, the technical team will have to discuss how we're going to treat with the matter of children. And as Mrs. Celia Brown said, when we come back to the definition section, it will again spawn into another discussion. But I just wanted to point out two things, Chair, that we need to come to some consensus on the, period the limitation period which is easy of the two but i wanted to go back to make the connection between the ver the reconciling the jurisdictions that i had said before and i just wanted to take the committee through it what ministry of labor and social security was saying so if we go to 25 which is where we are now that deals with the making of a complaint what they're saying is that on the section, on the clause 13, and clause 13 speaks to jurisdiction to hear complaints. They're saying there's no mention of 25 on the clause 13. So in relation to 25 regarding the making of complaints and the relevant applicable section that the jurisdiction be reconciled as set out on the section 13. So 13 says... Subject to the provisions of this part, the tribunal shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine a complaint made by a worker, a complaint instituted by a student, and so on and so. So I think what they're saying here is that maybe an insertion that a complaint made in accordance with clause 20, section 25, it would be section 25. Uh, made by a worker, so on and so, student, whatever. That's what we're saying that there is no there is no reference between the two there. And then in clause three, subclauses one and two that speak to duty of the employer to ensure an environment free of sexual harassment. In clause 13 now, clause 13 makes, oh, sorry, clause 25. So, Three subclause one and two are referenced in clause 25, and that's in paragraph B. We will see here a person who alleges that an employee or a person who is in charge of an institution has failed to comply with sections three, subsection one, or 
three subsection two respectively may subject to so make a complaint in writing so they're saying it's captured in clause 25 but there is no parallel reference to clauses three sub clauses one and two in 13 so 13 speaks to when it does reference sections it references five it references six it references Four, four, seven, eight, and nine. Eight and nine. And we agree that it would also reference four, four, and 34. But it doesn't reference three, one, and two. But three, one, and two are referencing 25, 1B. So they were just saying that we need to reconcile the jurisdiction among those sections 25, 13, and three. Any response, colleagues? So, so what, does, what does she recommend? What would what would be the quick solution? You just make sure that they that they the references are 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 the similar are similar. It's nothing the that, consistency yes, of so, it. Right. Right. So is there is there a proposed amendment now? Just where would we include three one and, and three two? Where would we adjust to to, to because as it sounds like something that could be easily uh, it is easily mended with, with it's easily fixable. So what they're suggesting is, is that you look at 25, 13, and 3, and you, you, you make sure, as, as Chair said, that you have consistency. So 25 references 3, 1, and 3, 2, that you can complain against an employer who has not made the environment free from sexual harassment. But in 13... That speaks to that the tribunal shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine mm -hmm. it doesn't reference any breach of three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I understood. So, Chair, right. through you, perhaps um, the legislative team could just come back because I don't think there's any. It's just to, no, to, to, no make, to ensure the, the correlation. So they could probably just um, come back with a proposal and we, we move forward. We just want the consistency that connects yes. the three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, Ms. Grant? Yes, Chair. And, uh, and then we move on to 25.2. That's the other one? Yes, Chair. So I believe that there would have been varying proposals in regards to this time frame. Um, can you illustrate them for us if they were captured? Some of the proposals made, some did not have a problem with the 12 months. Some propose that the 12 months needs to be removed altogether. Some propose that the 12 months remain with a caveat being that there is an enlargement of time provision in circumstances, based on the circumstances of the case, uh, delay, why did it come, um, whatever the circumstances are that the tribunal uses those circumstances to determine if they should enlarge time beyond the 12 months and some suggested that the 12 months be three years as opposed to 12 months so the suggestions are varied so let's start from the standpoint colleagues a determination to be made whether or not we should amend from the 12 months and what should that amendment be? So we can now open up for discussions. Senator Longmore. Well, if, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Chairman, if I, if I may suggest, um, I have, uh, I think this issue is such a critical one that I'm not sure if we would get the final consensus without the minister's involvement in the decision. So I'm just wondering if maybe we should move forward and go back to this in her presence. I just, I'm, and I'm just putting that there. Thanks. Well, no doubt, Ms. Grant, thank you, Senator Lamour. No doubt, Ms. Grant, that this one is a policy decision. Correct? Yes, Chair. But in, you see and a determination has to be made. What I wanted was a sense or a feeling from the committee if they are so in, if members are so inclined, or sure. do we leave it? Yes, Mr. Sorry, Cilio. sorry, but 
it, it is a policy decision, but remember this bill is before a joint select committee. So the committee can have discussions in my view about, I mean, about the way forward. Uh, and then you make a you make a decision that will then be um included in your report, which would be um sent to the to, to the house. So I I I I don't see any harm even if you don't make a decision in having extensive this because this was discussed extensively, if you remember, in the public domain. Right. Some different um views on it. So I, I don't see why we can't have a discussion. And um even if you want to wait till to um and, and I agree. Let, I, I believe we need to have a it, it was brought to us, the concerns were raised before um before the committee and so even if it's a policy decision um arriving at a decision may very well be influenced by the submissions recommendations or what would have entailed coming out of the discussions of the committee chair just to say uh, just to give it some context too that when the ministry was looking at this that in our uh, Ms. Com sorry Ms. Um, Ms. Oh. Ms. yes minister yeah happened to um been sort of using one air i have two I use one, <laughs> one for the JC, JC meeting, one for the other meeting. And I overheard that it would be a policy decision as to determine the time. Yes. Period. And if, um, if we were to amend. If we were to amend. And I would recommend that we amend that, you know, and that we look at the maximum time that could be accommodated or facilitated in this legislation. I just want to put that on the table and then that can be discussed and we can be guided by the technical team. F thank you so that, much, Chair. Thank, thank you so you much for that. that. Thank, thank you for that, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. And in line with what Minister said, Senator Gale, I was going on to say that in our comparative research, what we found was that in some countries, the time limit is three months. In other countries, the time limit is six. In, and we thought that a happy medium would be the would be the twelve. Just just to just to give some context to the discussion, and so we can take it from there. We used the CARICOM model bill, and the CARICOM model bill certainly did not go beyond a year. So, just to put that out there. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Senator Scott Motley. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had also looked at some other jurisdictions, and as you would expect, I would have looked at Barbados. And there I found out that the time limit was three months. I also looked at the CARICOM model as well. But there are two things that impact me, because at first I thought that the a uh, 12 month period was quite satisfactory. And it was in fact what Senator Longmore took us through with the sort of trauma, which might be experienced by somebody who was sexually harassed. That made me consider that perhaps one of the ways in which we could reconcile this and certainly take into account the public's view is to go for a longer period than the 12 months but, but apply the enlargement principle. That is to say that if somebody came to the tribunal and said, let us say that we settle on the three year, which was a proposal which was made, I think by the Norman Manley Law School, that for example, if someone was to come to the tri tribunal to say that because of these circumstances, because of my fear, because of the fact that I was afraid of losing my job, for example, and would, put forward a convincing argument that would, uh, uh, you know, allow for the delay that that ought to be considered. Personally, and I know this is probably going to earn public rancor, I think the 12 months is adequate, having regard to what it is we are trying to achieve. And I do, but I do support that there should be an opportunity for enlargement in certain circumstances. 
um, are, are you, am I to understand you saying, Senator Scott Motley, that if there was to be a consideration for an enlargement, then there would have to be specific circumstances that would trigger that enlargement? No, I'm not saying that really. I'm saying oh. that I'm one of those persons who have confidence that the selection and appointment of a tribunal would be a rational and reasoned sort of decision. And so I think that it should be left open to the tribunal to contemplate whether or not the reasons advanced are reasonable. Uh, okay. Senator, so, Senator, if I don't believe for, that it's better, better their discretion, because sometimes when you're crafting legislation, you don't anticipate all the circumstances that might be relevant. Right. So, Senator Scott Motley, for us uh, medical minded people, <laughs> um, could you could you give give me a, a legal um, vision of enlargement when you say enlargement specifically? Is that it, it escalates? So, it, it, you can escalate it to a higher. So, for example, if we were to agree at a year, but mm -hmm. somebody comes with a complaint outside of that time frame, Correct, say that yes. two years, three years, mm -hmm. and they can say. I, I am requesting uh, that my complaint be heard because at the time when the offense, when, when I was being harassed, I could not afford to report it because I depended mm -hmm. on this source of income mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I was afraid of the consequences because remember sexual harassment usually takes place, they say vertically and horizontally, but often vertically because of the power relationships. Okay. So there might so, actually be time, for example, Senator Longmore, the medical doctors who complained about the, what their consultants, um, mm. you know, it's an allegation, I put it in that yes. context, yes. that the, what they were fa facing in that mm -hmm. fraternity. There might be reasons why they could not come forward within a year, because yes. their entire so, livelihood... So would be jeopardized so, in that so what context. you're saying is that a legal provision can be made to see to accommodate those circumstances yes yeah, so the time frame okay. can be enlarged those okay okay well i think that's i think that's a reasonable approach um but i think i think one year is still is still short i think i, I would go with three years and that provision to be honest with you i that's yeah I wouldn't have a challenge with the three years if they, okay. uh, but I should also hear from the technical team. I know they have done their research as I have, <laughs> and I think we should get some guidance from them. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Fraser Beans. Thank you, Senator Scott Matley. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. And you know that perhaps this is the first time that I'm going to be on the opposite side of Senator Scott Matley. <laughs> um, with her provision for one year and, and her proposal for one year. And I do understand um, the, the, the context, but I wanted to find out from Senator Scott Matley if perhaps she can think of any situation outside of the examples that she gave relative to being in fear of your job or you know just needing this for your livelihood that a tribunal would consider in giving an extension over the 12 months that's the first thing. And the other thing, Chairman, is I know we have agreed to do further work on the discussion earlier regarding children, but this discussion also underpins why it is so important for us to treat with children in a very different way. Because if the tribute, if sorry, if the committee, for example, were to agree that we will go with one year or three years, we still have to, and I'm not a trained doctor, but I know that Dr. Long, um, Senator Longmore will give me some support here. We still have to consider how children are impacted by this kind of trauma to the point where three, four, even six years later, they still can't either talk about it or they would have buried it so deeply that it takes a particular event, maybe a decade later, for them to recall what happened and, and why we have to bear that in mind and be, 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 be balanced in how we approach it. So that's my comment, but I certainly would want to find out from Senator Scott Motley if there, if there is any other situation outside of the two that she gave where a tribunal would likely 
grant a hearing outside of the 12, 12 months? Well, um, Senator Fraser Bins, <laughs> it is very strange to have you disagree with me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm enjoying, just, I'm just, enjoying I'm this. <laughs> no, but I, 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 in fact, would not be opposed to the three years that the Norman Manley Law School had suggested. And in fact, the part of my, the, my shift was because of what Senator Longmore had said in a committee meeting where she indicated and quite clearly expressed the trauma that one who has been sexually harassed might experience. And this is one of the reasons that I think could also be advanced to a tribunal. If one were to be able to show, for example, that one had to go into for treatment, had to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist as a result of what they experienced. That, for, that might be another example. And the reason why I don't want it, the, the categories to be set out is because, as I said before, we might not be able to anticipate what could cause somebody who has been harassed to delay making the report. It is a very, you know, the, the whole question of harassment is very, very subjective. There are some women who that sort of overture, they will just laugh it off. There are some women who would be totally traumatized by such an overture. And so I think that whatever we decide as a committee must take into account the fact that it is personal to the complainant. Thank you, Senator Scott Motley. Senator Longmore, you have another comment on this? <laughs> I have a I have a comment. You see, it spurs deep um, conversation, and and something just came to me, Senator Scott Motley, a while ago, where Ari is is harassment the act that is committed versus the reception is are we to interpret it? Sorry, are we to interpret it in the context of the act that is committed versus the person and the effect that it has on that individual, the victim? Um, in terms of the, you know. All right, let me just put it in a little bit of a context, how critical this time limit thing can be. And it is the message that we're gonna convey to the society and to the, the awareness to victims that they have an option. This is why this is very critical. This is a very much spoken about aspect of this bill. And persons argue, whatever we say, you're gonna hear, well, it's only one year or it's three years, then put it to, you know, them change it, but then put it to three years. Or you're gonna hear there's no time limit. That little boy out in St. Thomas, the little one who got his manhood dismembered by a 16 year old child who himself was a victim of abuse. It is not infrequent in circumstances like that, that in therapy, we realize that that 16 year old, he remembers and he recognizes and remembers that a cousin used to repeatedly molest him at night, that uh, 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 the auntie who would visit and stay over with mommy when he, was, when he was seven years old would come into his room and molest him at night. And individuals suppress these things. And sometimes, so I am very weary. I, you know, I, I recognize that You're, you're on Sorry, mute. I had a phone call um, for it to be expanded. But I am, I am really very particularly concerned about the message that we send that there we have zero tolerance and that victims will always have an avenue. I think, we, I think that's what I would want to ensure we, we get out of this. Chair. Yes, Chair, Senator I, Scott Motley. has her hand up and I hope she will allow me to just make a comment based on what Senator Longmore has said. I think that when we are having this discourse, we must always go back to the purpose of the legislation and not conflate it with other intentions. The purpose, the legislation specifically this defines what sexual harassment is and the effect of that sexual harassment. And it says that it has the effect of interfering unreasonably with the work performance of the person to whom the sexual advance is made or creates a 
an intimidating, offensive, or hostile work environment. And I think elsewhere, it speaks to the situation with um, persons in the institution and so on. But I think fundamentally, we need to always focus on the purpose for which legislation is being enacted. We can't in, there's separate pieces of le legislation intended for different things. And I want to invite people uh, before we come back to discuss this matter to take a good look at the offenses which have been created under the Sexual Offenses Act to see if some of those might not address some of our concerns. But thank you, thank you, thank you. I am I'm fully, fully cognizant, but it starts, it can start somewhere. So I, I stand um, and I appreciate that guidance, um, but it, I perceive harassment to me when it comes to a child, almost on the same level, to be very honest with you. So for me, it's an automatic criminal offense. And I think that's how I would proceed throughout the legislation with respect to children. Yeah, but but and, and respect, for, for Senator Longmore, this it does not criminalize the offense. It, it, in fact, it does it's it's civil liability. And I don't think that for children we should have have their their experience categorized in a legislation which deals only with civil liability. So you and I are agreeing. Right. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. So, Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I Senator, agree. Fra Senator Fraser Bins. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was really enjoying the, the dialogue between Senators Longmore and Scott Motley. But Chairman, I, I, I am I'm happy that both senators agreed in the end that the issue of how we treat with the child has to be taken out and treated in a very different way. I, I don't know if I have come down to a time frame, but I think what is important, Chair, is I know that I'm not in agreement for one year um, limitation period. The issue of sexual harassment is as Senator Scott says, a very personal thing, but it's also very subjective. And Senator, Senator Longmore will speak about all the psychological effect it has. I am of, a, of the view that in trying to find a reasonable timeline, one has to consider the effect on the person who has been harassed, as well as I, won't, I don't know if I want to say the effect, but how it impacts on the person who harassed. And if we were to extend the time frame to an unduly period, say 10 years or maybe beyond six years, then we have to consider the issue of memory and how that, of course, will impact on the person. I think that it may be useful, and I know Senator, Senators, Senator Scott Matley would have done some research in the area, but I am not, I don't know if outside of the Caribbean, there, and this is where the technical team, Mrs. Um, Georgette comes in. I wonder whether she would be able to share with us or just remind us what obtains in other countries in terms of their period of, their statutory period. I recall, a very prominent case recently where, though it was not a sexual harassment case, it was more of a sexual assault case, that these matters came about after years. I mean, years later, 10, 20, 30 years, they were being made public um, by the victims. And, and, and when you listen to the interviews, some of these victims were very convinced that this in fact happened. And so we have to be mindful of that. We also need to be mindful that the alleged perpetrators themselves could not, some of them could not recall ever doing it. And so, you know, Chairman, I think that for me, an, an, an approach that seeks to strike a balance, I'm not gonna say balance of interest, but seeks to strike a balance between the victim and the alleged perpetrator is going to be the best approach. And that proposal is not a one year or is not a two year. It's not 10 year either. So it is somewhere in my mind between perhaps say three to six years. I'll be inclined to agree to that. Thank you. 
Senator Fraser Dennis. You know, when this particular area has been the subject of much attention in terms of <clears throat> these proceedings. And uh, when I saw it first, I recall my everyday hat where an employee of a large organization after more than 24 months brought an allegation to the table. And uh, when the question came up as to why that allegation was brought after so long a period, it was out of fear of losing the job. It was out of fear of getting bad performance appraisal where those performance appraisal continuously would have triggered possible termination. It was out of fear of not getting promotion. It was also out of fear of losing a scholarship that was awarded to the individual. And it was also of the hope that the matter would go away. But what prompted the individual to finally come forward was that she saw that other employees were exposed to it and that gave her the strength to come forward. But also in a situation like this, when you don't have a defined period that is so reasonable, you also have the possibility that existed then under the, this, that situation where the defense representing the alleged perpetrator challenged the fact that the individual took too long and that it was not so, and that she had created some fiction out of her imagination against the manager. And so you have these situations that we have to deal with on a given basis, both in treating with representing the alleged victim and in the defense of the alleged perpetrator. I am one that is of the view that it would require, based on those experiences and circumstances, the consideration of a longer period. I would love to hear, however, from the, the other members of the technical committee who may have had, may have examined what provisions are made in other jurisdictions. Yes, Chair, just to have been listened to all that the members have said, um, they, what, what I have been finding upon my examination of some pieces of legislation in other jurisdictions, I have found the most I have found, and that is in the UK legislation, that's the Protection from Harassment Act 1997, particularly Section 10, uh, Section, yes, yeah, Section 10, which speaks the limitation. This was an amendment made here. And it said, after Section 18A of the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1970, whatever, whatever, two goes on to say, Subject to subsection 3 below and to section 19A of this act, no action to which this section applies shall be brought unless it is commenced within a period of three years after the date on which the alleged harassment ceased or the date on which the pursuer in the action became or on which in the opinion of the court it would have been reasonably practicable for him in all the circumstances to have become aware. So the UK... Protection from Harassment Act 1997 says three years. I looked at the Belize legislation, which is also very clear in its wording. Belize gives 12 months. The court may decide not to carry out any investigations or as the case may be, 
may decide to discontinue any investigations where and I go down. A period of more than 12 months has elapsed since the doing of the act and the complaint was not lodged before the expiration of a period of 12 months since the doing of the act. I also went and I looked on the Trinidad and Tobago legislation and they gave a period of no more than six months. Notwithstanding subsection 2, the commission in exceptional circumstances may accept a complaint which is lodged more than six months after the date of the alleged act of discrimination. Read, read that part again, please. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding. subsection 2, mm -hmm. uh, and subsection 2 says a complaint made under subsection 1 shall be lodged with the commission within six months from the date of the alleged act of discrimination. And then 3 goes on to say, Notwithstanding subsection 2, the commission in exceptional circumstances may accept a complaint which is lodged more than six months after the date of the alleged act of discrimination. So this gives, we were speaking earlier about enlargement of time. Right, that was what Senator Scott Matley had, had represented. Yes, so three would give the enlargement of time provision. So there, what I have been finding is that there is a time limit. But then in other cases, there are some legislations that allow for the enlargement of time provision. There are others that do not. So we have a determination to be made. Whether or not in the first instance, it remains at the 12 months. Whether or not in the second instance, there's an expanded in terms of the time frame or whether or not it remains at 12 months with an enlarged men provision. Or the Could three those... years. Yeah, sorry? Or the three years as was suggested. Or, or the three years that was stated. Well, that would, have, that would have been the one that I spoke about with expanding the period over 12 months. So if, if, if the committee is, a... yes, Senator Scott Motley, you know, when I see you raise your hand, I will just stop <laughs> abruptly. Sure. I really, I take into account what the minister said while she was listening with one ear. Right. And I think what I sensed was that the policy direction that she would embrace would be for the six years. I am proposing that we consider the three years with an enlargement of time. With an enlargement would, of time. With an enlargement of time, which would satisfy uh, the concerns of um, many persons, including what Senator Fraser been said about what what the the person accused would face, and what you also said about um, the fact that the, the 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 attorney at law who represents the defendant can sometimes get a window to challenge the right. authenticity of the complaint. Right. So I think I think that, that I think that a three year with an enlargement would meet everybody's concern. So would the committee be in agreement of putting that forward as our as the recommendation? I um I I think I'm with I'm with the minister of going for the maximum. I would go six with, with the enlargement. Six with the enlargement. Six with the enlargement. Senator Fraser Bins. Again, you know, Mr. Chairman, again, I will have to do what I don't normally do, but I will have to support Senator Longmore and go against um, Senator Scott, but then take that smile off your face, Mr. Scott, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> because, you know, it's very rare that this happens. <laughs> I mean, it's very rare that I go against anything said as a Scott Monty saying, but um. Once you agree with even, me, I'm okay. And even more, and even more rare that you agree with my side. No, we always well. <laughs> you know, I always I agree with Senator uh, Senator Long more. <laughs> but um, seriously though, you know, yes. um, Chairman, taking everything into consideration, including the the information shared by. Um, the technical technical team just now, Miss Georgette, and um, the fact that other Kirkham countries 
have a shorter time frame and we normally look to them for guidance and we look to other countries for guidance. I don't believe that this time, given the very dynamic and um, game changing nature of this legislation, that we should take guidance from there. I think we should lead the way in that regard. And we can't ignore the national outcry, if I may use a term, um, when this matter was aired and the time frame was revealed and just how people felt. And you know, as legislators, we have to respond, not emotively, but we have to respond to the needs of the public. And we have to take their views into consideration. And everything considered, I will go for six years. I mean, it's a start, it, it's a, a civil offense, and we do know that at the bar there is a stat, uh, there's a limitation for civil offense. So again, um, that's another reason why I will support it. With the with the, the the provision that in extraordinary instances the panel can look beyond the six years, but I think that six years really is a reasonable time, everything considered. Thank you, Senator Fraser Bins. MP Tamika Davis. Thank you, Chair. I just want to lend my support to Senator Scott Motley since we are doing teams. Uh, I believe that it strikes the right balance. Uh, all the points raised earlier, when we consider not only is the complainant but the person accused, it seems to my mind to be a good compromise to allow three years. So we say that the victim has had three years, but more importantly, the tribunal has the option of after hearing good cause, as, we, as we've done in um, section 25, where the person doesn't make a complaint by way of writing, if they can show just cause why it is otherwise, then the tribunal can hear it as well. Likewise, in this, this scenario, we have a tribunal with the option to say, if you can show just cause why you are not bringing this matter some 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, at that point, we would have, I think, struck a perfect balance between the rights of the accused and the rights of the complainant. I think three years is good and reasonable. All right, Ms. Grant. Yes, Chair. So we have two scenarios before us. Yes, Chair. We have what is considered in my mind, a tie in terms of an approach. Well, what is your vote, Chair? Uh, no, this is where I'm going to leave the vote to the real chair. Yes, yes. But, chair but we know that we know the real chair's yes. vote. No, when? no, no. The, the fact <laughs> of the matter you know, is that the real chair would have to hear both contending views and properly make a decision. I agree with you, Chair, but I you see I'm writing uh, I'm writing uh, the two positions. Yeah, make that, a point though. Oh yes, yes, yes. MP siblings. I have been listening to my colleagues. And in my other life, I have um I have represented both institutions and individuals who have been harassed sexually. And I am of the view the the balance of three three years is is a balance if there's a provisio there for expansion. Six years with a provisio um, would not would be tilted in a way. And when I look at this bill, everything about this bill so far seem to strike a balance. 
It is gender balance. It looked at um, everything in a balance. To, and to go to a six year with Provisio for expansion. Chair, Chair. Is something that I would, I, I, I'm not so sure. Because three year with expansion is really with the option for expansion, the provision for expansion is really, Chair, really. But one second, Senator, Senator Longmore, allow him to really, finish. Really expanding it beyond six year, beyond 10 years, you know? And it really put one in a position to not abuse the intention of the act in, in, in circumstances, because there are circumstances that persons, for example, one is studying and the studies is more than three years, five years. And the person might not have um, wanted to jeopardize e him or her ability to obtain their degree or diploma or, or the, the, the certification. That is a justifiable reason to bring to a tribunal, showing the tribunal that this person would have discriminate, would have used it so I quite understand that basis. But um, the coin has two sides. Eh? And there are circumstances where there are allegations that are false allegations that are proven to be, can be proven to be false. And where somebody is just being malicious in their intent. And to, to I mean, to have this open thing that you would not, there would not be a need to show just cause beyond three years. Um, I am in line with the uh, three years with provision for an expansion. Chair. Thank you. We have Senator Scott Motley, hand is still unraised, and MP Davis. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, I just forgot to take it down. I'm sure you have heard enough from me today. No, I will never hear enough from you. Now, <laughs> member Brown Burke, the only other member that has not made any participated in this aspect of the discussion. You have a view? I'm just calling on you. Chair, she had sent a message to say she was. Oh, yes, 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 she did. Sorry, she did. So, um, member Davis. Can yeah, I go after still... after chair? After member Davis? I remember Davis' hand is still raised. All right, Senator Lamore. Uh thank you. Um uh MP Sibliz, you know, one of the one of the, 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 the primary issues that the law, if not the issue that the law obtains for is justice. And when a victim is affected, there's no, there's no necessarily a, a time limit on that. Persons can be this a, a, a harassment experience, especially one that is probably long ongoing and, and in, a, in a situation that is, is entangled in other situations can contribute to lifetime issues that the person has to deal with. So for me, a limitation of six years is still small. 
but that is what we can, that is the limit. Because six years is a short time relative to a lifetime of dealing with it. So I am sorry, but the, 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 I think the law should be on the side of giving the victim as great a time to, to feel able to get justice. Because again, the perception and this aspect of the bill is probably the most spoken about in terms of public interest. And so if we, we, could, we could send a significant message of it being six years versus spending a lot of money on PR to promote persons knowing that it is three years, but you have an expansion option beyond that. That's, that's just my, my perspective. And I would prefer to err on the side. We, you spoke of everything being balanced. Personally, for me here now, I prefer to be on the side of unbalanced towards the victim. Thanks. Mrs. Robinson. Chairman, Chairman, if I, if I so sorry. Mrs. Robinson, if I could just make a quick intervention, if you don't mind. I yield. Thank you so much. Chairman, again, you know, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I just, and I, I do understand my, my colleague's view, but like Senator Longmore, I too feel strongly about the time being leaning towards the opportunity to report. Again, you know, we, we can't truly understand unless we walk in the shoe of a victim. And, you know, again, I wanna just, if you may, help us to recall some of the prominent cases that took place even outside of Jamaica, but within the last year or two years, we're talking about the Supreme Court justice um, and his matter and the more than 20 decades that it took the victim to come forward. We're talking about, you know, matters such as the Jeffrey Epstein matter and how many years, I mean, decades that it took victims to come forward and talk about it. And when you hear their story, they talk about issues such as um, blaming themselves. They talk about issues relating to almost can't believe that this would have happened to me. We're talking about their livelihood. We're talking about issues such as trust. You know, these are persons that they trust. They would have developed some kind of trust relationship and have to get to the point where they accept that a breach has been committed against them by someone in whom they trust, um, someone who they trusted. And, and when you think about all of those matters, Three years is not in my mind a reasonable time for a victim to come to terms with it. I recall sharing at one of the meetings my own experience when I worked at another place with a, a lady who was about, I think she would have been in her 40s, who was molested as a child. And it took a particular life-changing event when she went on the general anesthesia for her to talk about what happened after many, many, many years. And so, you know, we have to consider all of those things and find a way to ensure that these victims do not lose their voices. And I believe six years is a reasonable time, everything considered to give these victims, both men and women, an opportunity to speak, and I completely understand the need for the balance. I spoke about it earlier, but what we have to be cognizant of as well is that times are changing. If you look at the United States, for example, they have amended a lot of their state's law to allow the reporting period to be extended in some cases by another 20 years. So children, you have, I think at one in one state, maybe it was Alabama, they, you had to make a report by the time you were 23. No, they have extended that. So the world is moving, the world is changing, the world is recognizing that issues of sexual assault and in our case, sexual harassment are not issues that you can just report on like that. You know, it, it affects your inner being. 
And I think it is a recognition of that um, internationally, why the timeline has been changing. And I think that as we contemplate this new legislation, we too should recognize that and give that opportunity to victims to have their voice, but strike in the balance so that the alleged perpetrators themselves are not disadvantaged um, in terms of memory loss. So I, I just wanted to say that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fraser Beans. Mrs. Coburn Robinson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it is, I'm listening here and I think I feel it a lot because I'm speaking here on behalf of persons who have complained to us about sexual harassment, persons who have brought cases in, of sexual harassment and the research. I'm looking at empirical data that we have gathered and that we have gotten through numbers of uh, uh, surveys that we've done, informal surveys, surveys that we've done, formal surveys we've created. There was a point that we had a intervention through the Jamaica Civil Service Association because of the reach of the Civil Service Association and our gender focal points. And what we discovered is that it's overwhelming that persons feel that sexual harassment, though for some persons it is pervasive and they think it is too subtle. There was overwhelming evidence that sexual harassment is something that should not be swept under the carpet, should not be treated lightly, and should be given the kind of treatment that it deserves. The victims, for example, spoke about the disproportionate uh, impact of sexual harassment on women. And most of the cases that were brought forward were cases of women complaining. So yes, we have had cases of men complaining of male harassment against male, female against male, but the numbers that we have seen certainly and what we have collated since we've started this uh, very, very important work on sexual harassment and even through the policy itself, we're to the back of the policy. If you were to look at what I had shared earlier with Anilo, you will see that we have some findings and research uh, data that has been garnered because we've seen the importance of research. And so using the empirical data, using the experiential methodologies, using our own experiences from, you know, from the Gender Bureau, I would be in favor of the heaviest, longest, most uh, impactful, which is the six years with an enlargement of time. As a matter of fact, whatever is the largest, I am speaking on behalf of the Bureau and on behalf of the numbers of cases of victims who have experienced sexual harassment and perhaps are unable to come forward, are unable to articulate their perspective. Some of them are visually impaired. Some have hearing disabilities and other impairments and we have had to speak on their behalf. So I'm not belaboring the point, but I'm just saying we want to go with the maximum. Thank you for that opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mrs. Coburn Robinson. And, you know, one of the things that always helps us in making decisions especially those that are policy driven would be data, the research and the information. In this case, you know, listening to the arguments being put forward, there has been none in terms of a reason why it ought not to be expanded. No argument has been put forward as to why or is there any, would there be any disadvantage or any damage in having it extended beyond the 12 months. Um, my own take on it is that I would go for the longest period because having seen and having worked and having heard cases presented and the trauma that individuals would have had to go through in terms of dealing with it, just to be able now to have a legislation that you can have comfort that your case will be heard and will be addressed is good in my mind. And so, um, I believe Ms. Grant, when we are doing the report, 
this particular area, reference ought to be made in terms of the submissions around this. And uh, we can put forward this to the minister for the ministry to make that policy decision in the most appropriate way. Yes, Chair, I'm making a note. Any other concern you had with 25? No, Chair. This sounds as if this 25 was 25 plus plus. <laughs> That those are the only concerns, Chair. What other area you wanted to um, represent? And colleagues, um, just to say, I had another meeting at 5.30. So I'm going to ask if we can go up to just 5.30 and close off for this afternoon. Mr. Chair? Yes. Oh. Again, you know, one ear. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I can give some guidance. Um, I kind of heard most of the discussions here, and I know it is important to strike a balance. But I don't think there is any harm in going for the maximum and then um, expand. Yeah. Right? I think um public opinion um has been very strong um it will do no harm if we go for the maximum and then have that option to expand so i just wanted to that that to guide in this in in this regard subject of course to the technical um team indicating to us um what obtains as well best practices etc all right, but that would be the, the policy guidance subject to the technical team guiding us as to best practices and what they would consider compared to other legislation, what we should do. All right. Thank and you, I Chair. Your, your heavy hand, your steady hand was needed. <laughs> Thank um, you. Um, chair, chair, if I may. Yes, Senator Um. I just want to clarify, when we say maximum time possible, are we looking at the six years or the overall maximum time possible? We're looking at the six years and then okay. expand. Right. Okay. So six years, because I would not want us to go overboard and go, you know, because we, we also have to be legislatively practical and prudent, I think. I'm looking at the six years and then we yes. can, okay. again, <laughs> subject to what the technical team, the guidance we get from them at this point. Okay, one, sure. one, one of the guidance that I would look for is how you treat defining expand, exp, the expanded period. Yes. Will there be a cap on it? Will there be circumstances to trigger that expanded period? So to, for, the, for, for guidance to the tribunal. So, so um, my, my acting chair, I'll, I'll leave those deliberations. Now. Right. Good. Uh, and do you agree? Because I have to leave at 5.30 to attend another meeting and I'm not so skillful in that one to listen with one ear like you and the other. You can end at 5.30. Oh, thank you very much. Wait, of course, with the members agreeing. I agree, Chair. I agree. Yes. Okay. We have, we have lost one member just now. Yes. All right. Miss Grant, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Miss Grant? Yes, Chair. We, we can do 26. Yes, sir. 26. Oh, wait, wait. Before we go on, Chair, oh. just to bring you back to 25, right. I had was... raised that one of the suggestions made was to put the complaint form in the schedule, in a schedule of the legislation. Ah. Yes, yes. That, that yes. was not agreed on. Right. And I, I'm, I'm strongly recommending that because we would need that as a guide. I think there was one submission that was made in terms of how do persons make the, the submission, what procedure 
what prescribed format would be there. So members, we can agree on that. Fully support it, Chair. Thank you, Senator Scott Motley. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Senator Longmore. Anything else on 25, Ms. Grant? No, sir, that would take so we, care of we, it. We can move on to 26 now. Yes, sir, 26 and 27. Okay. Okay, 26. There was no useful suggestion on 26, speaking to particulars of complaint not to be communicated. Okay. I don't 20, know. If there was any comment from any member in relation to this clause? No. 27? The same with 27, Chair. No useful comment made in relation to 27. So we can have it stay as is. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight chair lack of grounds relating to complaint. Only one suggestion, and that's coming from JTEC. And they are asking that twenty-eight be amended to read. Pursuant to a report, oh, let me read what is here. Pursuant to a report submitted by an authorized officer under Section 27.5, so I'm reading from the bill now, where the tribunal finds that there is no evidence of sexual harassment, the tribunal shall in writing inform so on and so forth. They are recommending that an amendment be made to read pursuant to a report submitted by an authorized officer under Section 27.5 where the tribunal finds that there is no evidence of sexual harassment or that a charge of sexual harassment cannot be sustained. And then the other things remain. So they are asking for the words or that a charge of sexual harassment cannot be sustained to be inserted into, into the first paragraph of 28. So, so this is where no evidence, but they are so, they are adding to it where a charge cannot be sustained. Yes, sir. Is there a difference? Well, one of the things that I recall them mentioning when they made their presentation was that you could give evidence but mm -hmm. it is not strong enough to support the allegation of sexual harassment. I see. So they're saying where you give evidence, but it's not strong enough to take you over that threshold, then, because they're saying as it is now, it, it does not cater for someone like that. Members, any comments? Chair, it will be it will yeah. be a char, it will be a claim or not a charge. That's the only thing. A claim not sustained. Yes. Because but in the first instance, it will be cited as a claim. It's, and it's civil liability. Okay. <laughs> so are you suggesting that the insertion would be in a uh, for to include a claim not sustained, substituting what they were indicating in relation to charge? Yes, I'm just I'm just asking for yes, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Charge and substitute claim. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else on that? We can move on to twenty nine. Yes, chair. Yes. We can. Move um, on. Okay. Should it be um, claim of sexual harassment or just the word claim? Cannot be sustained. Should it be? Does the word claim that would change, or would it just be? Um, um, I would say claim of sexual harassment. It could be either. I mean, we have a defined claim. Um, we define a complaint. So um, we define complaint. Yeah, but really, well, a complaint cannot be sustained. Yeah. Well, I mean, we. Well, look, I mean, we're not drafting now, so I mean, 
I can look at the language and see yeah. if I would just use the word complaint with I would because it, it's a complaint means to section 35 or whether or not a claim of sexual harassment. I'll look and see with which one with which language is more appropriate. Okay, thank you. Um 29. 29 chair has all right, that's procedures to apply in relation to a hearing conducted by the tribunal. These are the suggestions that were made. So on the matrix one, and Ministry of Tourism said that there was, there's a typographical error at 29.3b, which reads, 3b, which reads shall lake. So it should be shall take instead shall of take. shall lay. Norma Manley Law School proposed that for the purpose of an inquiry and the proof of the alleged offensive conduct that the complainant communicate his or her objection to that conduct. However, failure to communicate one's objection should not be a bar to any subsequent complaint, he indicating that each matter is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Hmm. Sorry, read that again, please. I think I might know why you asked me to read it again in our chair because I'm looking and I don't see how it applies. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> to this section. So, it just never connected to me a while ago. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll flag that chair. I'll go back yes. and look there. Okay. Uh, uh, Matrix 2, that's P PSOJ. They said on the 29.3 that it suggests that the aim of the tribunal is to mediate rather than hear. And so... They suggested that 29.3 should be deleted because it is their contention that 29.3 seeks to create a dual purpose for the tribunal. It's, it shows them as a conciliatory body instead of a tribunal that is set up to hear matters. And on the matrix three, you will institute of gender and development studies indicated that it must be made clear to complainants who whom they should report matters to and what steps should be taken for redress. And those are the suggestions in relation to 29, sir. I want to deal with 20, 29.3b to which is a PSOJ that made reference to it being conciliatory a body and, and that 29.3 should be deleted you're mute sorry that subsection 3 of 29 yes. should be deleted yeah, should be deleted now they under the LRIDA it makes provisions for this to take place, notwithstanding the fact that there is a dispute, it also gives the right to either party the opportunity to amicably resolve the matter. And it views it against the background that An agreed settlement in most instances may be better off for both for either party than an imposed award. It also takes into consideration the question of relationship in the workplace. And when I say relationship, I'm specifically speaking to the working relationship. That notwithstanding, notwithstanding the allegations brought forward and how egregious such allegation may be, 
fact of the matter is that both parties tomorrow morning may have to coexist within the workplace. And so I believe what 29.3 is seeking to do is to provide that opportunity for both parties to arrive at some sort of a settlement before the matter is heard. And I don't believe that that clause, that subsection should be withdrawn. But then um, member Sibley's and member Davis and Senator Scott Motley has their hand Senator up, Scott sir. Motley. The question of you know having these scenarios in court. So Senator Scott Motley. Chair, it is the way in which the legal profession, for want of a better word, is or the legal process is unfolding, is that a mediatory approach is always encouraged. Let us bear in mind that these are not criminal proceedings. They are civil proceedings. And so there's no danger or harm in having the matter resolved. At the end of the day, that is the outcome which we seek. And if the parties can use a mediatory approach where they can speak about it and come to an agreement, I think that should be encouraged. Remember that this is all bound up with the issue of restorative justice and all right. those other elements which we have begun to appreciate as ways of resolving conflict. I think it is a good thing that if it is possible at all, an amicable settlement should be arrived at. Bearing in mind and stressing and emphasizing the word amicable. That amicable. is to say, nobody is trying to impose a settlement in circumstances where the parties, and in particular, the complainant does not wish it. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, Ms. Grant, I think Oh, Member Davis. Thank you, Chair. Just to agree with both. Hardly hearing you. Is it better now? Is it because you change location and you change all manner of things? <laughs> Not hearing you. That is quite so. Just to agree with both uh, you and Senator Scott Motley. I support those views wholeheartedly. Thank you. I support it, those views. Uh, yes, member siblings, I was waiting for you, you know, patiently. <laughs> um, so, Mediation on that is note, always the best way for a civil matter. Right. Um, and on that note, Ms. Grant and members, I believe we can conclude for today. Um, Ms. Mack, was there a proposed date for the next meeting? I, Senator, I think next week, Wednesday at the same time. Next week, Wednesday at the same time. Yes. So on that note, can we have a motion for adjournment? I so move. I seconded. Who moved? Senator Scott Murphy, since your hand is up, we'll take you as the mover. And Senator, <laughs> <Indeed. laughs> and Senator Longmore, giving support. Thank you very much, colleagues. So we continue next week at item 30. Yes, All sir. right, take care and please stay safe. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 members, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone.